So I'm happy to welcome um, Kevin on stage to talk about how to build a million billion dollar business model. This is your time. Thank you. Hi. Uh, as she mentioned, my name's Kevin Novak. Uh, first of all, a couple apologies. First of all, uh, sorry for this being scheduled at the same time as the Game of Thrones actress. I appreciate you all making the right choice coming to hang out with me uh, to discuss pricing. Uh, second apology, I apologize, I'm out of uniform. We had a little bit of a, uh, uh, a uh, wardrobe malfunction backstage. They're looking to try and get me a larger pair of lederhosen, but happy to be here nonetheless. Uh, two things, first of all, I really believe in the tell them what you're gonna tell them and then tell them school of presenting. So the agenda, I wanna talk a little bit about me and my background in terms of how it intersects with Uber uh, and with pricing. Uh, secondly, do a little bit of an exploration of just why is pricing important? I think most of us here are founders or sort of in the entrepreneurial space. There's some fairly obvious applications. Just talk through a little bit of some of the uh, things maybe you're not thinking about. Uh, I am an active data scientist, so this has math and data wrapped right into the presentation. Um, do a little bit of an example of just what does it mean to have an efficient marketplace. Um, secondly, a little bit of just sort of strategic questions. What is dynamic pricing appropriate? Um, and if we have time, go through a couple suggested methods for how you might want to think about implementing pricing yourself. So, first of all, you should know that I'm actually not an economist by training. So all of my experience with pricing has been stuff that I've learned usually by breaking the laws of supply and demand once or twice. I'm actually a physicist by training. Uh, got a background in nuclear physics, worked at a particle accelerator, uh, a little math and computer science br sprinkled in. Uh, as she mentioned, I am the 21st employee at Uber. I was their second full-time data scientist, their first head of data science. Uh, and one of my big focuses early on, I spent the first two years building out dynamic pricing at Uber. So if you've ever been surged in an Uber, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, after that, spent a couple of years building organizations and then spent like the last year of my, comp of my time at Uber focused on a different kind of pricing problem. So I was building out a product called Uber Freight. Basically, it's a freight brokerage where we buy and sell uh, freight opportunities for log haul truckers. Uh, See, I'm still using the Wii. It's only been a month since I left, so. Um, but that sort of pricing opportunity, much more the sort of classic asynchronous, how do I buy this and then sell this at a later date? Uh, in parallel to that, I'm an investor, I'm an advisor, I work with lots of companies in terms of helping them think about how they do pricing. Uh, these days I work as an entrepreneur in residence uh, for a venture studio called Playground Global. I also do a little bit of investing on the side. Okay, why is pricing important? So obviously, there's obviously a money in, money out question, right? This is pricing, it has to do with how much we charge. But I wanna sort of talk through sort of three unique opportunities for how pricing intersects. First of all, when you are a gr growing consumer product, pricing determines customer uptake and engagement. You know, the notion of a loss leader. How do I engage with customers? How much are they willing to pay? The freemium model is a great example of how you could use pricing as sort of a strategic differentiator to bring customers to a product to sort of activate some of those network effects. The Uber referral credit program, very similar example. Secondly, for a service platform, for example, you are a aggregator, you drive demand to people who provide services. Pricing opportunities are part of that effective partnership, right? When we were working with Uber partners, we were able to say to them, listen, we've built mechanisms, we've built systems with them, so that you are going to be paid what your time is worth. It's sort of an integrity relationship that comes with being an aggregator for a service provider. And finally, for a brokerage, it's all about the prices you buy and sell at, right? So this is fundamentally the spread between buys and sells, that's your revenue, obviously less your operating expenses. So the ability to not just sort of price an opportunity, but figure out what is the target margin I'd like to take on top of that becomes this sort of hierarchical pricing problem that's important you get both right. Uber, in my time at Uber, I actually had to tackle all three of these at different times, which is sort of why I wanted to highlight them. But the most important part of dynamic price, people ask me all the time for six years, why do we price? Why do we price dynamically at Uber? And it fundamentally came to this idea of we wanted to make sure that Ubers were reliable. And what that means is, I'll get a little bit into the math here, but first I wanna highlight, this is a deck, by the way, which we'll share afterwards, has a lot of 
links in it. I wanted to share a paper that one of my team published, one of the papers I'm most proud of, that talked through what economists like to call a natural experiment, engineers like to call a system outage. So what happened was, on New Year's Eve, uh, about three years ago, we had a surge outage. And essentially what happened was the system by which uh, prices adjusted, and you can look at a graph up here on the top, um, went offline. And so we had a window where the market was incredibly high, where we might otherwise normally price Ubers at greater than baseline fares. Uh, and they regressed back to normal fares as sort of our fail-safe mechanism, and we got to basically respond, how did the market respond? Um, and you actually looked right in that window. Uh, oh, interesting. Um, there's a red window here that's not coming up. But right during that window, or actually the percent of requests that we complete dropped by almost 80%, right? Now, there's actually some really straightforward mathematics why this has to work. And I didn't have to show proprietary data at Uber, which is good because I'm now a former employee. So I'm going to give you a pseudo model of economic efficiency where I can use pseudo real-time data. So as I said, I'm a data scientist. There's a little math. For those of you not mathematically inclined, bear with me. It's only two slides. First of all, Efficiency, we're going to define it as the time spent earning divided by the total time, right? If I'm behind the wheel of an Uber and I'm driving for 10 hours at a time, how many of those hours was I actually spent making money? Now, if you want to break that down to the efficiency of a single transaction, you could say the time spent making money, obviously the time when your Uber partner is on trip, divided by the overall time of the transaction, basically the time of arrival plus the time of trip, right? The marketplace efficiency, just sort of generalizing that. Probability of being dispatched times efficiency. And by the way, this mathematics is entirely generalizable to any sort of logistics or even really, uh, uh, well, logistics ride-sharing marketplace. This is actually very mathematical. I'm just using ride-share terminology just as sort of based on my background. Marketplace efficiency, probability of being dispatched times the efficiency of that transaction. So again, the probability of being dispatched is in other words saying how utilized is the fleet, right? If the fleet is 50% utilized, you have 50% odds of being dispatched. Plug in all this mathematics, you end up with this really interesting equation at the bottom, right? Where your efficiency is actually a function of the utilization of your fleet. There's actually a feedback mechanism, and that's really critical in understanding why dynamic pricing is effective. Right, so again, pseudo real data. If you look back at some of my old talks, I was able to use real data, bear with me. But I want you to just do a little bit of a mental thought experiment with me. Um, ETAs along the y-axis is basically the time of arrival of an Uber as a function of the utilization of the fleet, right? Uh, the dotted line represents 100% utilized, as you can imagine. So at low utilization, right, there are Ubers on every corner, there is a jet plane at every uh, uh, airport, you know, there is a semi at every dispatching center. Um, the time of fulfillment, basically how long it takes a car to get to you when there are cars all over the place, doesn't very much with the utilization, right? The market is saturated with cars. And as you can imagine, at 100% utilization, the time of arrival of an Uber is functionally infinite, right? There is no time. There is a pole, and to use the mathematical parlance, in the equation. Um, this sort of middle graph, I'm using just a for example here, but that curve of basically how does ETA increase as a function of utilization is actually really interesting to analyze. Um, and it has a lot to do with sort of the geometry of your system. So for example, in the Uber ride-sharing case, the actual road network itself uh, has a lot to do with basically how, uh, how many cars you'd need to cover a given square kilometer, square mile. So interestingly enough, for example, you can there's an interesting blog post we've done about this where you can correlate it to basically the year when the city was founded. So for example, in the US, uh, the city of Boston, roads were laid down before anybody thought about cars. It's like an urban planning nightmare. Um, needs a lot more cars per square kilometer uh, to serve rideshare demand effectively. Contrary to a city like Houston that was founded in a relative, comparatively more recently, but they had a massive urban planning renewal in the 1960s, um, is incredibly efficient for Ubers. You need about 30% fewer cars to cover the same amount of ground for the same amount of demand. Um, so that curve 
varies a little bit by every city, uh, but they all sort of look like this. So if you take that graph, reminder, this is the equation we're plugging in, and you plug in utilization, you plug in the curve here, you actually end up with this curve, and there's a hump, there's a turning over point, right? So market efficiency as a function of utilization does not maximize at 100%, believe it or not. That dot is really interesting to us. So it says something really interesting about a given marketplace, right? What it says, first of all, is that the most efficient state of the market is not 100% utilized. It's less. In San Francisco, it's actually about 67% roll of thumb. So you can basically uh, maximize the utilization of every driver in your fleet if you keep one in three of them empty. It's counterintuitive, but it actually checks out. The other interesting thing about that efficiency number, when we were doing this study early 2013, 2014, that number was also in the mid-60s. I don't have the exact number. Uh, uh, but the idea being that you can't actually get 100% of a driver's time occupied uh, when they're working in a marketplace like this. At best, 60% of your time is spent making money, about 20 to 30 is spent en route to a customer, and about 10 to 20 is spent open. Okay. I think that's all the math. I take it back, there's one more math slide, but bear with me. When is dynamic pricing appropriate, right? So going back to this slide here, that regime over on the right, past the red dot, is a bad situation to be in from a marketplace point of view, right? Because what it's saying is, first of all, your market is, has diminishing returns in terms of how efficient it is, but there's a more pernicious problem, right? The actual transaction time as you are getting closer to 100% utilization is getting longer, right? As a market maker, this is the worst situation I want to be in. Right when I need my cars the most, they're actually taking being occupied for more time. So you need something other than consumer behavior, other than a product experience, to sort of throttle customer demand, incentivize supply. That's where pricing comes in. Okay, back to when is dynamic pricing appropriate? So I like to break it down to sort of two questions. When people are saying like, I'm thinking about pricing, I really want to focus on this, like tell me, give me some suggestions about the right strategy here. I break it down to sort of two fundamental pillars. One is a, bit, a little bit more of a soft question of just sort of who knows the most about your marketplace of all the people in it. Um, and secondly, is a very, I'm an engineer, there's a very pragmatic sort of technical question where even if things are right for dynamic pricing, there are certain sort of technical requirements which need to be satisfied. So market knowledge issue. So there's this interesting problem where if you sort of go and you, and you poll your users, right? You say, okay, I'm, say I'm a service provider. I'm somebody who's sort of connecting buyers and sellers. I'm gonna do a focus group of buyers and a focus group of sellers. And we're just gonna ask them sort of their intuition around like what opportunities are worth, um, what a price for a given uh, product should be, and just sort of like, you know, take the temperature of the room a bit. Well, you end up with some interesting sort of corollaries to that. So if sellers have the most information about your marketplace, I don't actually recommend that you be build out a dynamic pricing system. You should just become a pricing aggregator. Let your sellers set their prices, bring all of them together, and sort of provide value to your customer through sort of a comparative pricing experience. Um, companies like Kayak, Booking.com, these sort of systems, many of them sort of adopt this strategy when it comes to pricing because they believe that hotels or hotel chains in many cases um, have a better understanding of what their products are worth than they do as sort of pass-through companies. If your buyers have the most information about your system, then you should be eBay, right? Your buyers are able to say, absolutely, I know what that's worth. And if you are trying to quote a price to them, they're either gonna say like, nope, that's too high, or oh my God, what a great deal. Either way, that's not an awesome customer experience. So I actually recommend you do auctions, right? And the idea being let your buyers sort of seek the right market price through some sort of user input type mechanism. Ads are also similar to this. But if the platform has more information than either the buyer or the seller, you should use dynamic pricing. And I think Uber is a classic example of this, where um, both buyers and sellers, in this case, transportation providers or those looking for transportation, have a very first-person point of view about their sort of transportation experience. I am here, I need to go there. Maybe I have some rough knowledge about what the transportation situation in my city might be. You know, like if I asked any of you what time rush hour was, 
in your sort of city at home, you could probably quote it to me, right? You have some IQ. But none of them has sort of detailed real-time information about it. They don't know what streets are closed. They don't know, oh, you know, there was a fire here and they blocked off this street. They don't know that, you know, there's a tour bus in town and they happen to be blocking this other street. Uber has all this insight, right? We have all of these sort of real-time car sensors providing this to us, and we're able to sort of predict customer demand in aggregate uh, into the near and, and long-term future. Another good example of this is we do a lot of assessment around events. Uh, so things like, say, uh, a baseball game gets out, 5,000 people are about to open their Uber app. You know, we pay attention to those sort of signals as well. Something maybe you're not thinking about if you're just trying to get home, but you have to only live three blocks from the baseball stadium. So first of all, if you want to use dynamic pricing, you should have more information or the mechanism to gather more information about your marketplace than either your buyer or your seller. With me so far? Yep. I'm seeing some nods. OK, architectural requirements. So this is strictly from the engineering point of view. To price dynamically, you need to have the ability to collect timely information from your marketplace. And timely is one of those like beautifully vague words where it can mean a lot to a lot of different people. But the thinking here is timely is basically you should be able to collect information at a scale that's about 10x faster than your market actually responds to prices, right? So a good example, um, what I mean by response time, uh, as many of you know, we've had several hurricanes going through the southeast in the United States. Uh, the United States uh, southeast is actually a major freight corridor. So when I was working in the, in, at Uber Freight, um, we actually ran some studies where we started to sort of look at uh, competitors or, or analogous systems that were pricing opportunities. And we just looked at how long did it take from the time the hurricane was announced to the time where prices deviated meaningfully by, like, say, more than 5 or 10%. And you can actually measure this. Like, there's sort of a, like information propagation time to your marketplace. Figure out what that is, and then make sure you're collecting information 10 times faster than that. Right? And the reason is because you need to be able to make informed decisions at a time scale much quicker than your market does. Second, your user experience needs to be modifiable on the fly with the ability to modify pricing on a per experience, per user basis. For many people who are offering like sort of desktop applications or systems where there isn't quite that over the wire fungibility, and this is something that might require a major architectural rewrite. For most of you who are doing sort of SaaS or, or mobile experience, this is sort of a no-op, but it's something that's important that you call out. Uh, and then finally, you should be able to log the user response. So there needs to be an input data stream from the sort of pricing decision that your user makes beyond the basic, like, okay, they paid, you know, X number of euros for this transaction. The Uber app, for example, um, has a ton of user metrics which go into how many people saw a screen, uh, how many people clicked on it, how many people went back and changed their minds and then went again. You know, looking at that sort of like user decision behavior is a great secondary signal when you're trying to figure out, okay, what are sort of people thinking about the price of the marketplace right now? Okay, I've got two approaches, a little math heavy, but they wanted to make sure this was useful, so reaching out to all the data scientists out there. The first one is actually really interesting. It's, um, it has nothing to do with economics, believe it or not. So this is the true like sort of scrappy uh, entrepreneurial story. We started looking around at sort of what are dynamic processing systems. This is back in Uber in 2011. This is actually one of the early models for Uber surge pricing. Um, we started looking around and sort of said, how do people think about sort of this dynamic pricing program? And then what is something which is quick, scalable, and basically easily communicatable out to all of our operations teams who have to sort of work with our partners. Um, and we came up with something from control theory. So in control theory, it's sort of a, it's an area of computer science and electrical engineering. Um, and this actually equation comes from the notion of how much force do you need to apply to move a robotic arm to sort of achieve some sort of desired output. Um, and it's called a PID loop, unimaginably because it has three terms, one that starts with P, one that starts with I, one that starts with D. And the idea is that you take your price at a given time is a function of three terms added together with three sort of fitted parameters, um, all of which are a function of sort of the current variable state of the marketplace, in this case market utilization, and some sort of idealized 
state of the market, right? So remember that curve where I said San Francisco needs to be about 67% utilized? That's our target, right? Now we measure the utilization at any given point in time, feed those two things into this equation, right? And so mathematically, it works pretty straightforwardly. The first term, which does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to changing prices, is just a simple proportion term. How, what is your sort of current value as a ratio of the target value? Greater than one, raise prices. Lower than one, lower prices. Your second term is actually interesting. And this is something that we debated whether or not we'd want to uh, add or not. And it basically has to do with how long has your market been sort of over its sort of target state, right? So this is just basically the mathematical way of explaining that you know, if your market has been higher than 67% and you raised prices once and it didn't change and you raised prices again, it didn't change. The third time we're gonna raise prices even more to try and like apply more force to correct your marketplace. Um, and so it sort of has this lag factor where if your market isn't responding, you sort of push it a little harder and push it a little bit harder. Um, and then this third term is a correction factor. So it's a function of the derivative of utilization, in this case, our target variable at a given point in time. And what this has to do with is basically you want to correct for situations where, say, you're over your target state of your marketplace, but crashing hard, right? The derivative is sharply negative. You want to sort of blunt your market response and to make sure that it sort of lands softly at your target state, right? Same problem if you're sort of below your target utilization and falling. You want to respond with a little bit more of a, uh, a sharper response. Um, so the idea here is just put something in your model which responds to the sort of instantaneous derivative at any point in time. Okay, pros and cons. Pros, surprisingly robust to most market responses. Quote that back to your team. You are now intro data scientist. You actually have a product which you could take to market. Um, we actually used this model for about 18 months at Uber and deployed it across a large number of cities. Uh, we still use it in some sort of toy problems. Uh, but it actually works. It works surprisingly well. For three terms, which I could basically explain to you in three minutes, it's surprising how far it would get you. Um, secondly, it has pretty low requirements around data latency, that sort of response time I was talking about. You could actually get away with like, you know, maybe collecting data twice as fast, three times as fast as your market for something like this. Um, so for sort of a, uh, call it aspirational engineering architecture that's maybe not quite where we want it to be, um, this actually works quite well. Uh, the model behavior is easily explained, right? If I can explain it to, to an audience uh, in three minutes or so, easily communicable within a company, easy for customer support. Uh, model evaluation time is trivial. This sort of runs in basically 01. Um, and you can chart it geographically pretty easy. If you just cut your market up into different buckets, measure utilization independently, you can sort of price an arbitrary number of markets independently of each other, which enabled uh, Uber initially just had dynamic pricing, which was market-wide. So basically all of the Bay Area and San Francisco would price up and down. Um, we pretty quickly moved to a system where we sort of had geospatial pricing, where we could price neighborhoods differently to re from each other. Um, and, and this model r was really amenable to that. Um, cons, it doesn't respond to outside shocks really well, right? There's, remember I was saying where like we, res we anticipate uh, when baseball games are letting out. That's sort of a demand shock that you can somewhat predict. Um, this model doesn't incorporate that explicitly. Um, secondly, it doesn't handle small amounts of data well. Because it's a ratio of two numbers, you know, those numbers need to be relatively large. So in your system here, like these systems would work for anything less than like 50 cars on the road. Um, and and the, the other biggest con of all, um, our marketplaces are not univariate, right? There was only one input to this model. Like, everybody knows that a real-time marketplace has many hundreds of input. So we're oversimplifying our marketplace here. And we're sort of making somewhat effective but suboptimal decisions. So there's always an opportunity here to make your model uh, match reality a little bit more. Okay. Oh, I'm doing great on time. Uh, second approach. This will go really quick because this one is no math. Um, so the other way you can solve this problem, speaking to that biggest con, right? Let's, let's not oversimplify our marketplace. Um, the way you can solve this, this is another form of linear programming where instead of trying to optimize for some sort of target utilization, right? Let's, like, let's get the city of San Francisco to 67% utilized. 
you instead say, let's optimize so that the value of every transaction is maximized. Everybody has the most valuable transaction that they can think of. In the economist term, value can be uh, sort of an aggregation of financial value, but it also is sort of perceived value. Did this feel awesome or not? There, there's some sort of monetary number you could work out to it. So the idea is basically break every transaction up into the value to every possible person plus the sort of value to the marketplace, right? So value of the marketplace is really straight, straightforward. In this place, I call it financial value and market tightness value. How much is this transaction worth? You can sort of take your nominal posted rates. If you're in the case of a rideshare business, figure out, okay, this transaction is worth about $15. Now, there is some value associated with market tightness, right? And market tightness is actually a term from the freight industry or from, from the brokerage industry. So if you can sort of forecast the state of your market and say, okay, I expect a supply or demand shortfall, um, you could price your, your opportunity up or down as a function of that. And then there are two really interesting ones, perceived value to carry them. So for example, if you're in a business where your customer can signal preferences to you. So this is really true in like a B2B play. In our case, in the freight industry, it's fairly common for folks to say, okay, I'm a trucking firm. I like to drive between these two cities, right? Like I'd like to drive between uh, Munich and Berlin. You know, I'd like to drive between Paris and Berlin. They have some sort of preference. Uh, and you can actually bake that into your system. So you could say, awesome, you have a truck in Paris that'd like to get home to Berlin. Um, we will price this opportunity for you knowing that that's gonna be your preference. Maybe that might signal that we should change your prices in that specific situation. Or vice versa, you know, we make, we make sure that you're gonna go way out of your way. We know this is gonna be an inconvenience for you. Let's make sure that you're well taken care of as a function of it. Um, and then perceived value to brand. So this is where sort of business sort of growth strategy can come in. You know, if you're saying, all right, um, this is an opportunity um, that it's really important we get right, right? So it was fairly common uh, in the Uber case where if you had a really bad experience, like it was a priority for us that the next time we interacted with you, we nailed it, right? You had like a 10 star experience. Um, and part pricing is part of that. So you can actually bake those sort of signals into your bottle. Now what's nice is that almost all of these, those examples I've given you, are independently modelable, right? You don't have to swallow this elephant whole. You can just sort of bite off one chunk at a time. Like what is a good experience worth to us from a customer point of view? Relatively straightforward sort of user churn analysis. What, you know, what is it worth if we give you something that is, you know, uh, directionally aligned with your preferences or opposed to your preferences? Again, very straightforward modeling problem. So you can sort of break this question of like what defines value in a transaction into a whole series of sub-models, each of which can be optimized. Does that make sense? Seeing more nods. Right, it's late. I want to sort of make sure the blood sugar is coming up. Okay. Final thoughts, and this is sort of the catch-all because pricing is not something that I could effectively communicate in its entirety in 30 minutes. So first of all, pricing, especially dynamic pricing, is a rapidly evolving field. Uh, most of the work I talked about here today actually was current in Uber as of about the end of 2014. So there's about two years of stuff uh, which I have been asked not to share, and more importantly, was done by folks far smarter than I, so I'm gonna respect that. Um, Uber actually has about 30 plus data scientists who work on nothing but pricing. Uh, so this is uh, sort of one of these domains that you could start with one person um, and then one person who's very overworked and then it becomes two people um, and will rapidly become sort of a major component of any data science team if you make a strategic imperative to it. So be ready to sort of fund it with organizational love and people. Uh, secondly, the user experience. Uh, dramatically influences pricing. There are entire fields of behavioral economics that talk about sort of how do people interact with the design around pricing. I've consciously sidestepped it, but it is definitely something to be incredibly aware of. Uh, some of my former talks, I can talk through some of my, if you look them up online, I talk through some of my horror stories about why I should never do UX design. Um, third, pricing is a business decision with an ethical decision, right? We've made some fairly straightforward um, fairly candidly communicated trade-offs when it comes to Uber's positioning around whether we want to be price reliable or time reliable, 
we've made a fairly uh, uh, explicit statement that we're always going to have an Uber available for you. Sometimes you're going to have to pay more for it. And that's an ethical component. It's something that you need to be very aware of and think through. Um, and finally, avoid paralysis by analysis. So when Travis and I sat down and sort of thought about dynamic pricing initially, I said, great, give me like eight people in about a year. And like, let me just figure out a way to do this really well. Um, I think people tend to be uh, a little bit overcautious when it comes to pricing. And I think it's because money's involved and money is sort of one of those critical components to a system. Um, but this is me sort of signaling to you that I think people are overly cautious when it comes to experimenting with pricing, getting pricing right. Um, move quick, put something out there, make sure you build you know, uh, switches to turn it off quickly if it doesn't work. But I mean, Travis countered and said, you know what, let's get our first prototype out there in four weeks. And sure enough, we did. It took me about five, I was a little bit new, but, um, but yeah, we got our first experience out there in five weeks. And you know what, that was the right call because we were learning on the fly every day and our system got 10x better, 10 times faster than if we did it my way. So don't be afraid to sort of put a, uh, a half-baked prototype out there and iterate on it quickly. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. You know, when I was, please take a seat. Sure. Before we're going to have a look at the questions from the audience. You know, when I was listening to you, I remembered um, good old times. We learned at business school stuff like um, PowerPoint bullshitting. <laughs> and I'm sure there must be something like um, among, among mathematicians, um, something like equation bullshitting, just to test if investors are actually listening. <laughs> um, so I think I will, I will um, yeah, ask some of my buddies if they've ever done that. Sure. Um, it looks intelligent very fast, right? That's the cool part about it. It, it sure. can be overwhelming very fast as well. And to find a balance between simplification and actually being as sophisticated as you can possibly be is um, one of the most important kind of lines to draw at the right point in time. Absolutely. Right? So let's see what the question, what questions come from the audience. Have you ever thought of doing an auction? Um, Ig um, the highest, bigger, bitter gets the uh, Uber after a football game, okay, so that customers can actually um, place um, a price tag uh, in, within sure. their own preference to see who wins? Yeah. Um, so as far as I know, Uber has definitely thought about an auction. I think um, going back to the sort of market knowledge issue, there is definitely some research we've done that suggests that users might not always make the optimal decision when it comes to auctions, just in the sense of, again, limited information. Um, but more importantly, we haven't quite figured out a way to make the product experience awesome. Mm. Like, you know, the, the Uber is sort of this high-intention product. Ride-sharing broadly is a high-intention product. You go into the app when you want to go somewhere, like waiting for an auction to wind down is kind of a suboptimal feeling. So yeah. you've got to, like, you've got to balance market optimization with also, like, an awesome interaction with the app. Yeah, you have to make, find a way to make the loser feel good, which sure. can be a challenge. Okay. <laughs> sure. So, um, who do you think will win the race um, of the players in the market? Come who? on, how could I be unbiased about this? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, I, I could ask, did your mind change a few weeks ago when you left the company? So we could dig into that in a few sure. seconds. Who could disrupt your relatively new market? I have a question. Was it journalist asking that question? <laughs> no? Okay, great. I have no, what um, would Werner say? I have nothing to announce at this time? No, teasing. No. It's fine. So, honestly, what do you think? Not as a former Uber employee, sure. but... Um, I'm incredibly proud of what I spent the last six years building. Um, and I think that, that the company, um, while being far from perfect, uh, has done a lot of things right. And mm -hmm. I think that they're well positioned now and in the future. Uh, I spent the better part of the last year working really closely with a lot of people who I love and respect, um, trying to get Uber back on the right path. And I felt, I, I honestly like, um, it goes beyond sort of a professional obligation and more of a personal obligation. Like, I wouldn't have felt comfy moving on if I didn't feel like they weren't set up for success. So, That's nice I'm excited. Yeah, that deserves an applaud. <laughs> honestly, it does. Um, but we haven't answered the second part of the question, uh, which is very interesting. So talking about disruption, and you sure. know, the, um, there is also math involved, but math saying that we will experience um, a thousand times 
more development than the last century, which can only be done by exponential mm -hmm. uh, growth or uh, exponential development, which is per se definition of the disruption. Mm -hmm. So who will disrupt that market? What's next? What is next for the rideshare market? Um, good question. I mean, the, the wave of autonomy is obviously the most common thing that people are talking about. And I think the, uh, the autonomy, like, like the rideshare user experience, I think is going to be really interesting. But like transportation, just sort of broadly intersecting autonomy strikes me as the far more interesting disruption. I mean, like, like what are roads going to look like when you only need 30% as many cars? Or f I mean, like there are studies that with basic autonomy and ride sharing, New York City would need 42% as many cars as they have now. Like, what are we going to do with like 58% extra like square footage on our on our roads? Right? How do we use that? I think that's really going to be where the interesting disruption is going to happen. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Um, I mean, Elon Musk has a different take on that. Sure. Right. So he is um, proving or, or doing the math of if we could actually, before we solve that problem of not using that many cars anymore, or we could make streets more efficient by just making digging tunnels much more efficient mm -hmm. than they are today, and then we do autonomous driving through a tunnel where there is no risk of any kids running into the streets. So he does the math about that and actually shows a quite interesting business case. So what do you think will happen first when we think about the future of mobility? Will we just change the streets, the area where our cars are driving, or are we actually revolutionizing mm. mobility uh, habits altogether? Sure. So I mean, I, I think that there are there are like really three, three big outcomes I see happening. One is, is what you were alluding to there, where, where if we only need 40%-ish as many cars as we actually have, you know, we consciously chase down that dream and suddenly you know, we have like the, the broad equivalent of like what the High Line was in New York City, where we just massively repurpose transportation avenues. Yep. Um, the second one is a little bit more pessimistic, and it sort of has to do with the idea of like, there's a theory in urban development that human beings like sort of only wanted to live within like, I think it's an hour of where they worked. Yeah. And as transportation got more efficient, that just enabled sort of suburban sprawl. You know, highways enabled you to live further out in the country and still get to work in an hour. Um, and so there's this sort of pessimistic view that, okay, if we only need uh, you know 40% as many cars, that means there's gonna be, we're gonna end up with 70% more drivers and sort of immediately get back to yeah. gridlock again. Um, I don't think that's likely. I think that that's sort of too much of a known, like a known vulnerability for us to like stumble into that sort of suboptimal outcome. Uh, or the third outcome is I think sort of a massive shift in just what transportation means, right? Hmm. I think tunnels allude to this where um, several, I have several friends and colleagues who like worked at things like in the Hyperloop. Um, and, and they talk about things like, imagine if you moved like shipping ports offshore. Imagine if you like move them like a mile offshore and only connected it to the tunnel and reclaimed all of that sort of like beautiful acreage and prime real estate square footage exactly. in front of the ocean and just like massively rebooted how a city works. Yeah. Like that to me strikes me as like as the coolest outcome and probably the one that I'm like most interested in inventing the future in. <laughs> and totally understand it. By the way, do you own a car? Uh, I do, huh. uh, but unfortunately it's only because I just got a dog and we can't get Ubers and dogs. So. My puppy made me get a, made That's me get a car. That's a good excuse. <laughs> so to the next question, what market industry um, are you excited about where data does not play a big role yet? Yeah, um, there are a couple. Um, the ones that I think everyone's talking about, uh, insurance tech is really fascinating to me. And I think there's a little bit of a personal approach where um, I grew up in the Midwest of the US where sort of insurance was like the industry to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, there's a massive amount of information that nobody's really using yet, and, and, and it dramatically influences what insurance costs, who's qualified for insurance. There's sort of this whole rebalancing of risk outside of the sort of financial component that I think is really compelling. Um, there are also a lot of really interesting sort of operational municipal workflows that fascinate me. I've been taking a really close look um, at trash and waste management. Like, is there a way that we can pull more recyclable and reusable goods out of the waste stream in a way that doesn't make customers' lives any more inconvenient. Like that strikes me as like an interesting data problem that nobody's thinking about. Interesting. So I mean, as you're obviously looking for a new job, sure. Um, 
Are you, this sounds a little bit like it, I just wanted to verify, are you looking for something with a higher cost as your next employment? With a higher cost? Yeah, no, cause in the sense oh, of... Oh, higher cause. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I think that, that you know, the, this sort of dovetails a lot in the current thing about chase your passion, find what you're passionate about. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate to be in the position I'm in, um, you know, where, where the last six years at Uber have put me in a position where I can afford to t sit back and say, like, what's the highest leverage thing I can spend my time on? So mm, nice. I, I want to chase that a little bit more. I like that, too. So, so we have a technical question here. Is the pricing algorithm based on the kind of operating system and phone model? Good question. Um, so we had a couple um, hard lines in the sand when it came to things we weren't going to consider when it came to pricing. Uh, in the rideshare market. And actually, phone OS and phone model was one of them because we found it correlated really well with, um, at least the time when I was doing pricing, I can't speak to, I honestly don't know what they're working on now, but we found that early on it correlated strongly with some like socioeconomic factors, you know, yeah. that the, um, other things is we, we don't tend to modify individuals' prices based on their sort of individual history. We price markets as a group for the, sort of the same reasons. Um, so no, we don't look at phone OS and model. Okay. So what price tag would you use if you would start a project like this, um, building up a pricing engine today? Good question. Um, Uber was a Python shop starting on. Uh. I think it's, um, I still like it. I think it, it, Python uh, as a whole is this interesting mix of really well supported by the data science community, incredibly modular, not the most performing, but usually performing enough to adjust prices every couple minutes. Um, uh, sort of the standard, Python, MySQL, real time. I still like Node. Again, that was another one of the early Uber decisions I had some some weighing in on. Um, just handles data streams really well. Yeah, um, nice. Mm -hmm. It becomes more personal if you're sure. ready for that. You just we just keep asking questions and you just stop when you want to stop, right? So the negative Uber press did it influence your decision to leave the company? You know, if I was ready to leave Uber when we got bad press, I wouldn't have made it six years. I think mm. that, that Uber's a company that, um, at an individual level, certainly everyone I worked with, they're incredibly bought into the mission and the vision about what we're working on. Um, I think the press is more disappointing and frustrating more than anything in the sense that it's a reminder of how far we had to go to like how, you know, how much more opportunity there was. Um, but, Honestly, it was six years. I was really excited about, uh, I was, we were actually talking about this backstage. Uh, I'm a small company guy. Jordan knew when it was 20 people. I love that sort of like 20 to 50 stage. Uh, I was looking for an opportunity to get a little bit more exposure to it. So uh, I'm excited to work with the companies I'm working with now. I'm excited to hopefully join the ranks one day with my next thing. Uh, and we'll go from there. Nice. Okay, so that's a very important announcement here. We don't have a 10x candidate. We have a hundred or thousand x <laughs> that's candidate very kind. here. Thank you. So um, if you need someone who is incredibly smart in your team, I sh think you should get your pitches ready. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, welcome. <laughs> not for that. I'm not sure if you're allowed to say that, but what data is we using for dynamic pricing? Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the things I can't. I yeah, can't I, I thought about that. Okay. Next one. How exactly do you forecast for events? Mm. So how do you know 500 people want to use Uber at a certain point in time? Yeah. No, that's a good question. I mean, I think a, a large number of events are, um, well, uh, there's sort of two things. One is just obviously historical data. Like once you sort of see St. Patrick's Day two or three times, you can, you can build up for at least an yeah. interesting model. Um, for sporting events, it's actually really fascinating where there's sort of, um, like a, a cause and effect model in, de in demand, right? Where we can actually predict the outcome, or we can predict the demand at the end of a sporting game by looking at the demand going into the sporting game, right? And, but what's interesting is they're, verily, they're very rarely equal. We've discovered for whatever reason, people like to ride rideshare home from the game, but not to the game. Oh, that's unfortunate. Which is, but it's really convenient <laughs> for us because yeah. we can just sort of look at the little bump and then scale it up to the big bump later on. So you, you end up with those sort of like signal processing tweaks, which oh. can be really helpful for that sort of like semi-unpredictable event. So the last question, um, well, you, you mentioned that for your next, um, for the next company you want to join, you're ready to do something that has an even more or a higher social impact than what you already did. Sure. Um, so 
the next question was about um, where is the line between um, dynamic pricing and ethics? And you mentioned it before, but it was pretty much just one bullet line. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to ethics, um, sure. what do you really care about? When it comes to ethics, what do I really care about? Um, I would say that the most scary big problem that I feel like I could weigh in on, mm. um, and this is not pricing related, but it's data related, it has to be climate change. It has to be certain environmentalism. I mean, I think that if you can build, and I also happen to believe that, that companies, uh, for-profit companies are one of the most effective mechanisms right now to affect meaningful, sustained global change. Um, and so if you can come up with a way to marry those two ideas, find some way to turn a profit and do something which is, is you know, unilaterally good for the environment, come talk to me. I'm really excited about that sort of space. Kevin, I already want to thank you for all the energy you will put into the cost of saving our planet. And thank you very much for your time that you shared with us. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>